turning there. Um, just thinking about the last days, end times type of uh, thought process. And I'll just share with you that's something that the Lord shared with me. Is that, I mean, can I say that? Sure. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was a thought more than it was anything else. And it's not uh, really all that profound. And I, I'm not, it's not original to me, I'm sure. But uh, I've heard a lot of preaching lately and probably even said it myself that, you know, we're thinking about the last days and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're heading towards the last days. And, and even yet today I was uh, looking at some news report and uh, I see that uh, it might have been 18 or 28, it was a large number of Christians that were killed today uh, in a church uh, in, the foreign, in a foreign country, in a Christian church. Now, I don't know what that terminology means. Was it a New Testament church? I don't have any idea. They, they throw on the term Christian. Uh, it could have been a Catholic church for all I know. I don't have any idea. All I know is that they, they, they were martyred for their faith because it was other than somebody else's faith. I mean, that's the bottom line of it. And, uh, and it was, I think it, it, was, it was 18 or 28. It was a large number. And, uh, and I don't even remember the, the country offhand. Um, but, uh, and so we know uh, that, uh, you know, if you really did your research, Voice of Martyrs, I, I wouldn't agree with everything Voice of Martyrs does, uh, or, or maybe everything that they say, I guess, to some degree. But Voice of Martyrs is, is, not, a, is not a bad organization. And uh, they put out a, a pamphlet and several other things. And... Um, uh, they, they, they give you some real statistics on Christians that are dying uh, around the globe, something you're not going to get anywhere else, that's for sure. And it's, it's, uh, it's a large number uh, on a weekly, monthly basis that die for the cause of Christ. And, and Voice of Martyrs will give you some, some good hard facts about uh, Christians that are dying for the cause of Christ. But I thought, you know, we hear a lot of preaching, and I've heard this several times even in the past month, that, um, you know, if we're ever at the point, you know, where we're going to be tortured for Christ, and I heard a preacher say a couple weeks ago, bless God, it'd be a privilege for me to be able to do that, and you know, so on and so forth. And, and, and you know, I'm careful not to say that. And trust me, I've thought of it. Now, that's morbid. I don't even like to think of it. I've got to shoo that thought away. But when I think about the fact that if I were tortured, I mean, I can't be the only person that's had those thoughts, you know, the things that they might do to me or might do to my family to get me to denounce, right? And, uh, and so, you know, and I don't let those thoughts linger. It's not like I, I lay in bed at night and dwell on those things. My word, uh, I know that God is able. Um, but I, this week I was thinking about that because I'd heard another preacher make mention of it, and he didn't make this statement. This is just something that the Lord gave me. And, uh, and I thought, you know, Jesus said himself that they're going to take you before kings and, and, and so on and so forth. He, he, told, he told his disciples that. Uh, and, uh, and as they killed the prophets before, they're going to do it again. And, and, and we know that we're headed into those times. And, and, uh, you know, and so, but he said, in context, I'm going to get it wrong, I know, and, and, and I apologize for that. But he said, don't think about what you're going to say. I'll give you what you need to say when the time comes. You know what I'm talking about where Jesus said that? I believe he said it in, in, in the book of Matthew. I, I believe he said it in the book of Luke. I just read it recently. And that probably will have my, my thoughts stirring. And I thought, well, I wouldn't want to be in that position. And oftentimes, Brother Zach, I've probably planned what I'm going to say. I've thought about, man, I'm not going to reject. I mean, would I? I'm not going, man. But then I realized something. Wait a minute. That time's not, he, I'm not there. Brother Jeff, I'm not in that position. And I was just, gonna, that was the thought that the Lord gave me. He goes, look at all of my disciples. I mean, this is really the thought that the Lord gave me. He said, look at all of my disciples. They all said that they wouldn't deny me. Peter was the one that verbalized what the rest of them thought. I mean, it, they all went along with it. And, and yet, when we see Christ go to the cross, there's no disciples when we see them come down, they're not the ones that put them in the tomb. We don't see those disciples. And so, for all intents and purposes, when put to the test, they didn't pass. But wait. But yet you'll find that every single one of those disciples, except for John the Revelator, would all be martyred for the cause of Christ. Now, why is that? Because when the time came, they stood and witnessed for the Lord because back here, 
they weren't prepared. They said that they were lips. But there's a difference between lips and life. And there was some preparation time be between, this thought, between this place when Jesus said, all of you are going to go away. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. And now they've matured, right, in their Christian walk, and they've realized, wow, he really is Jesus. And when the time came, Peter would be crucified upside down because he said, I'm not going to be crucified like my Lord. Now, wait a minute. You're a Christ denier, my friend. And I'm not criticizing Peter tonight. But what I'm saying is, is do you understand that? That, you know what, if that time comes, Brother Jeff, let's worry about it when that time comes. Man, let's not worry about it now. My word, you know what we need to worry about right now? Preparing ourselves for if that time comes. Now, I don't mean what I'm going to say. I mean my life. I mean living for Jesus. And ju he, he's never said he wanted me to die for him anyways. He said, would you just live for me? That'd be a step in the right direction, son. I ought to just say yes, sir, and do that. That was just an interesting thought. It helped me. It encouraged me a little bit because I'll be honest with you, I can't be the only person that's worried about the days in which we live. I'm worried about when I look at the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the world and the direction that we're going, but I know this, that when the time comes, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And you don't have any idea but what I, I heard testimony recently of those that bore a testimony for their Savior at the latter days of their life, and that testimony was a stronger witness than they ever preached. I mean, uh, John Bunyan was used great, wasn't he? Pilgrim's Progress, second most read book next to the Bible, literature, written from a prison. Huh? I mean, you know, th think about that. How his greatest usefulness in life came from a prison cell. And uh, he used to say that that prison was his palace. He referred to it in his writings as his palace. He also uh, wrote a personal testament about his life, uh, Grace Abounding in the Chiefest of Sinners. Wonderful book. Wonderful book. I'd, I'd encourage you to read it. Um, but he, I believe he wrote that in that same uh, prison cell. And so, you know... Let God work in your heart now so that we're, we're prepared for the days and the dark days that are coming. It's not a time for discouragement. It's a time for encouragement because God wants to use you right where you're at right now. Amen? All right, there's your Bible thought. And, uh, and I know that we have a business meeting. Uh, Acts chapter 1, you got it? Stand. Please and thank you in advance. Acts 1, verse number 11. Acts 1 and verse number 11, and let's, uh, let's read this together, all right? Uh, Acts 1 and verse number 11, ready, begin, which also said, All right, now 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And uh, let me just read uh, one, I'll read two verses, verse number one, verse number five. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse five, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Father, help us. And Lord, I pray that you'd give me uh, an unction from on high and help me to preach the word with all boldness. And Lord, help your people to not prepare to die, but prepare to live. Because right now we're breathing in and breathing out. We have an opportunity to live for thee. And so we must be prepared for the day and the climate in which we live. And Lord, I, yeah, I, I, do, I am worried. I'm worried about the next generation. I'm worried about children, grandchildren, and, and other children represented in this room. And, but Lord, I know that you're in control. And, and so let me be an encouragement. Lord, at the same time, we need reproof and rebuke and exhortation all at the same time. Help us to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love you. I thank you for this great church and opportunity to stand again and testify and read and preach the precious Word of God that you uh, have entrusted us to. And so help us to do the job, Lord, uh, that only uh, we can do with your help. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. 
We're looking at the climate of the last days, and uh, we've, we've sort of been uh, bringing ourselves to this point uh, where we looked at, uh, we're looking at the fierceness of the last days, how fierce they're going to be. This snow also than the last days. It's in the word uh, perilous. We looked at the dangers, the delusions, and now we're looking at the deeds of the last day. We have a list here uh, that uh, is very uh, um, uh, relevant, so to speak, to the day and age in which we live. And if I give you, let me give you some encouragement that I read today on the internet, because the internet's never wrong. <laughs> We've got plenty of time, Brother Ray. Now, the Bible says that in the last, you know, after Christ is done, after the thousand-year reign and so on and so forth, that he's going to burn this old earth up, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? But I read today that we're good for 1.75 more million years. Hallelujah. So if you want to know when the Lord's coming back, well, I mean, Brother Hawk, they guesstimated between 1.75 million and 2.36 million. Big, big, big window there. So, but if you want to know when the Lord is going to come back, you just have to subtract the seven and the thousand because that's when it's going to burn up with fire and that's what they figure is going to happen. Well, they didn't really say we we're going to burn up with fire. They said we're just going to sort of go out of orbit and spin out into the, and we're going to move closer to the sun and then we're going to burn up with fire. I thought, you're a bunch of idiots. I mean, really, you, you want me to believe? Of course, then they backlogged all of that by, you know, the 30 billion years ago, the dinosaurs and this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you for predicting my end. I won't have to worry about it. My grandkids, great-grandkids, and 40 million other generations are not going to have to worry about it because I have 1.75 uh, million years before this thing is over. So if you want to know when Christ is coming back, just go to Newsweek. It'll tell you. And they, they seem to have it all figured out. <laughs> We're lit. Laugh. Please laugh. It's okay. All right? We didn't laugh much this morning. Let's at least just laugh a little bit. Uh, this, uh, but we know we're living in perilous times, and we know that the list here that we read, and we covered a lot of it last week, uh, we, we looked at lovers of self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemer, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, which means profane, without natural affection. We looked at that. Uh, we're at truce breakers, all right? Uh, it is there uh, in, let's see, without natural, uh, verse number three, uh, false uh, without natural affection, truce breakers, okay? Uh, this refers to those who will not keep their promises and more. Uh, they're irreconcilable. Uh, they're unwilling to see their hostilities, they're unforgiving, they hold a grudge for years, and they're next impossible to get along with. Mm. Man, that sounds like a lot of people, doesn't it? I, heard, I was telling you this morning that I heard about that preacher, or heard that preacher yesterday preaching about mercy, and he made such a profound statement that probably helped me out more than a lot of the other statements that he made, and he said this, and he gave great Bible example unforgiving or unwilling to show mercy is due to a, the fact that you've got sin in your life that usually has to do with the exact, watch this, the exact same thing that you are unforgiving or unmerciful to somebody else about. And I went, wow. And he goes, look at David. Nathan came to him after he took a woman that wasn't his own right? Had an adulterous affair with her, got her pregnant. God sent Nathan. Nathan said, told him a little story about a guy that had everything, but went to his neighbor and took the last little lamb that he had. And that uh, analogy there, when it speaks about that sheep or that lamb that the neighbor had, it was a pact, one that the family loved. And he took it and he killed it and gave it to his friends that had come over. And the Bible says that David was enraged and said, who is he? He'll restore fourfold whatever he's taken. Nathan, or Nathan said, thou art the man. Ha! He didn't want to show any mercy to somebody that, was, that had done exactly what he had done and not gotten forgiveness for. I thought, man, that's pretty good stuff right there. And how often we're around somebody that has an unforgiving attitude and an unmerciful spirit towards us, and what we want to do is look at them and say, are you struggling with the same thing? Hey, before you go any further, do you have something wrong in your life? Nine times out of ten, and probably more than that, 
they've got some issue that's going on in their life, and therefore they're not willing to extend mercy to somebody else. Well, I'll look at them and say, thou art the man. You're the one with the problem because we ought to be able to extend mercy. And truce breakers, we get this unforgiving spirit about us. Uh, that's why the Bible talks about don't let a root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You're not defiled. I mean, you're defiled, but you're not defiled only. You'll defile others around you. This is a picture of those who are unyielding and must at all costs have their own way. Sounds a lot like church people, doesn't it? I'll have my own way and I'll have it now. So we have truth breakers. We have false accusers. These are slanderers. These people do everything in their power to destroy the good name and reputation of another. This is also the same word. Do you know what, what word, what root word? Uh, we get another word from this word right here. Do you know what word it is? The word double. Isn't that interesting? Do you know how many times, Brother Kasten, in our lives that we enter into the devil's work? Every time we falsely accuse and slander and gossip. Every time that you do that, Christian, do me a favor. Just remember that at that moment you cease to work for God and you have begun to work for the enemy. You are now working on the devil's side. You've traded in your uniform and you're now working for the enemy. That's where that, that word comes from. Uh, we get the same, we get the word devil out of it. A devil is a slanderer. Isn't that in the Bible? He accuseth us day and night uh, before the Father. He's the accuser of the brethren. It is those who are uh, engaged in destroying the good name of another person. All right. And so uh, we have uh, those that are surrounding us. How about the word incontinent? This means without self-control or the ability to discipline one's life. If it feels good, do it. Why should I deny myself the little pleasures of life? Hmm. Sounds a lot like our Sunday school lesson, doesn't it? Adultery, lust, homosexuality, obesity, drunkenness, drugs. Should I keep going? If it feels good, do it. Nobody should be able to tell you what you can or cannot do. And especially God should not be able to tell you what you can or cannot do. Well, unless you're the government. Then we can tell you what you can and cannot do, right? Like you must have health insurance. We don't care if you want health insurance or not. It really doesn't make any difference to us. We're telling you that you're going to have health insurance, and if you don't have health insurance, we're going to fine you for it because we need more money. But please, let your children do whatever they want to. How dare you try to restrain them and hold them back and not let them express themselves? Do you, do you, I mean, are you confused like I'm confused? You say, are you not for government-mandated health insurance? Sure. When I live underneath communist rule, absolutely. I didn't know we were living in communist America, but we're pretty stinking close to it with all of our philosophies. And, and, uh, and so, uh, I mean, we, we don't have any restraint. Many lost people are careening through life like a car without a driver behind the wheel. I mean, just, I think a lot of Christians tend to do the same thing. It is the motto and the mission of our modern society to say if it feels good, do it. But 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Hmm. That goes contrary to the if it feels good, do it society. It's funny how the Bible will always answer what man thinks that it has figured out, isn't it? And so uh, we find that they're incontinent in the last days. They're fierce in the last days there. Look at the scripture. It says that they're incontinent. They're fierce. This is untamed, savage, it's brutal. It's people, uh, people will be controlled uh, by their baser instincts. And, and we see this trend going on in our society. Men literally living and acting like wild animals, aren't they? What do you think would cause a person to walk into, by the way, can I just plug something? Can, I mean, can I just chase like a 30-second rabbit? 30 seconds? 
because it jumped out, and I'll go ahead and go after it. Since we're talking about guns, I'll go after it with a gun. Isn't it amazing how yet again, as I told you six months ago or whenever it was, uh, speaking about gun laws, and I said every mass shooting in history aside from one, if you study history, took place in a no-gun zone, and Brother Ray, it just happened again. In a no-gun zone, a guy went in with a mass shooting, but yet gun laws are going to stop that. He wasn't, well, am, I, am I wrong, Brother, Brother Jack? Was he supposed to have a gun there? He wasn't qualified to carry a gun there. Gun laws aren't going to change that. Hello, dummy. That's a person problem, not a gun problem. There we go. I'm done chasing that rabbit. I got him, too. I shot him dead. I used my AR-15 on him. And I unloaded the whole 30-round clip. Amen, preacher. <laughs> But listen, do we not see that? Hmm? What, what causes a man to do that? Because men live like wild animals. I mean, we got no restraint in our life, do we? None. I mean, well, we're just, we just do whatever we want, whenever we want to do it. I mean, nobody's going to stop me. I, I mean, it's crazy. But that's what we've been taught, right? And so we see that they are fierce and they're despisers of those that are good. That's what the Bible says. In a world where good's evil and evil's good and those who stand for right are slapped in the face and the evildoers are lifted up, look at the entertainers. Last time I checked, most of you haven't run around, gotten arrested 37... I don't think so. Gotten arrested... Have you? gotten arrested 37 times for drinking and drugs and this, that, and the other thing, but yet I didn't see your name on the news for being a good, tax-paying, upstanding citizen, but they'll plaster them all over the news and say, well, they've just got problems. Yeah, they've got problems, all right. But watch those Christians. They're dangerous. I mean... They like the American flag, and they, they want their rights, and therefore the Second Amendment. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, and we also abide by the law, and we follow the law, and what the law says, there we do, as long as the law is not contrary to God. But yet, they'll plaster us all over the news. Isn't that funny? Hey, they'll tap our phones. Get in on our internet. How many of you know that the only place that our government doesn't go, the FBI, to find out what is being said inside, the only place, by the way, it's not a Baptist church, but I got you, you can guess what it is. The only place that our government does not go and find out what's being said inside the doors. A mosque. Just heard that statistic today. They do not go into the mosques and find out what they're saying. Wait a minute. Hold it. Correct me if I'm wrong. They radicalized somebody in Boston. Maybe they should have gone in and seen what was being said behind closed doors, huh? And when they do go in, they have to make an appointment. When they come through the door, they have to take their shoes off and follow all these guidelines and all these rules. Really? How about we have somebody meet them out there when they come here? Preacher, they probably never come here. You haven't seen some of the people that I've seen come through that door and wondered who they were and why they were here. You know how many visitors we've had? i got a stack of cards back there. I've gone to some of their houses. I don't think they live there. I'm not sure who they are. You say, you think the government's been here? I don't know. I, I, I'm not a cons Well, I am a conspiracy theorist. Who am I kidding? Yeah, I believe in all that junk, man. Black helicopter. There, there's one. Get a gun. <laughs> I'm for it all. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm for it all. I, I'm, I'm afraid of everything, including my own shadow. I don't know if they've come here or not, but I'm telling you the day's coming when they're going to. I mean, I was telling Brother Ravy some things that have been going on right here in your local New Testament Baptist church that you're probably not even aware of. And he went, are you kidding me, preacher? And I said, I get an uneasy feeling about this certain situation, and I don't know why, I just get an uneasy feeling, and I, and I almost would know that if I say the wrong thing, I'm going to be accused of hate speech. I'm not saying I'm going to go to jail. I'm just saying that they will say, He's a hey, he has hate speech, and I can't believe that he takes that stand. And by the way, it's all Bible. Amen. But there have been things going on that you're not even aware of. 
I'm just telling you, pretty strange, isn't it? We're the bad guys, and the bad guys are the good guys. I mean, we got police officers, man. Tell me those criminals don't have more rights protecting them than, than you do. You can't carry a taser in the city of Detroit, can you? You can carry a gun, right? Good, use it. We're, we're authorizing you. Use it. Forget the taser, man. <laughs> and use it on some of the... I won't say that. I would have said something Miss Mary really would have got. I was going to say use it on some of those dogs down there, too. <laughs> Look at her. She's, all, she's done. She's leaving the church over that statement. I know they've been having a dog census. This is what we're spending our money on, man. A dog census. My word. Nuke that stinking place. That'll solve the problem. All right. I'm done being political tonight. I'm just kidding. I like dogs. I have a stinking dog. And when I already threatened that dog the other day, I said, don't you think when things don't get tight, you're the first thing getting eaten? I don't care if you're small or not. We are going to stink and eat you. <laughs> She would look very nice roasted in the oven. That would be fine with me. Doesn't, just don't tell me. All right. <laughs> All right. We're despisers of those that are good. They're traitors. They betray others. They break friendships. And you know what most of it's about? It, it goes back to the very first thing. Loving your own self. See, I'll betray you because I'm out for number one. And I'll talk about you because it makes me feel better and I look better because you're a worse sinner than I am. Who are you kidding? Traitors. They're heady. That means reckless, rash, and acting without any reasonable thought. Oh my word. We could park there for about three days. No regard for a consequence. This speaks of those involved in the activities of a foolish nature. It describes a person who is reckless, who is headstrong in the pursuit of a bad end and under the influence of passion. It is conduct controlled by emotion, not conduct controlled by principle. And it is definitely not conduct controlled by the Word of God. That's what it is. Boy, do me a favor. Let's work on something together, all right? Everybody look at me. Let's work on something together. Let's be careful not to let our conduct be controlled by our emotions. Because I'm telling you that every single one of us in this room have got to find ourselves guilty of that. In this fast paced society, go, 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 man, I gotta go, I gotta go. And I mean, we are like, uh, and then all of a sudden something happens and our emotions take over and it is like an explosion at a nuclear factory to be around you. And there are things coming out of you and I mean you are just, and, and, and we stand in awe. Of course we did it last week, but, right? We, our conduct ought to be controlled by our principles and by the word of God and not by our emotions. Your emotions are a very bad, bad thing to go on. Some days I'm happy. Some days I'm blue. My disposition depends on you. I mean, come on, man. I'm an emotional roller coaster, Brother John, most of the time. Come around me. I'll laugh. I, I won't cry. You're safe with that because only sissies cry. But I'll laugh. I'll be upset. I mean, I'll, what in the world, man? I'm going to kill somebody. Woo! Was that a good joke? Should I let my emotions control me? I'm not that emotionally unstable. But my wife, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all women are, fellas, all women. <laughs> Let's be careful. Let's work on that together. To not, because when our emotions control us, you know what? You're going to say something, and you're going you're to be upset with yourself. And in the process, you're going to harm somebody. And I think it was Brother Mark that I brought out in Sunday school several months back there, that sticks and stones do break your bones, and names do hurt. And I don't like being called names any more than anybody else likes being called names. And they do hurt and they do bother me. And I'll take you to a load of people tonight that grew up in households where they were called all kinds of names and they're living out that that they were told. Okay? So let's not let our emotions. So, and that's what, that is exactly what the Bible is talking about right there. It's just don't be reckless. My word. How about high-minded? This is those who are puffed up with a false sense of their own self-importance. Has the same idea having to do with pride. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Those who uh, love the pleasure of the world more than they love God. Hmm? 
Mm, they didn't play at U of M Stadium yesterday, did they? What they did there the week before, right? 107, 17, how many, how many, how many 100,000 does it hold? 107? Come on, tell me. I already know you watch it. You might as well tell me what it is. Hundred and is it 110,000? Hundred ten, hundred and fifteen. There wasn't an empty seat, and there was people standing out front trying to get tickets. Packed. It was packed. Because there's people that are not in the game that are just down there partying it up. So we can extrapolate the number probably to 120, 130, 140, 150,000 people for a football game. Woo! So we can throw a pigskin up and down a field. Really? Church tomorrow morning. Do you think you could come for like an hour? We're going to have the heat on, the air conditioning. We're going to have lights. We're going to turn the fan on. It may be a little bit warm, but it may not be that bad. It all depends on what Sunday you come. I'm pretty busy. What do you mean you're pretty busy? Well, you don't understand. I have to do this, this, and this. Well, wait, wait, talk about, man. You, the football game, you had to get there seven and a half hours early. You, you got front row parking. You spent $355 to get a hot dog and a Coke. You paid who knows how much for the ticket. You stayed for the whole game. You couldn't get out. You started at 6 in the morning, you got home at midnight, and you can't come to church for the preacher to preach at you for an hour and a half? Well, I could see why your schedule is so busy. <laughs> lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Brother Mark, they'll pack that stinking place out for a pigskin or a basketball or a... I'm not going to preach about hockey. I mean, that's right, fellas, you're safe tonight. I'm not going to preach about hockey because I think, I mean, we'd cancel church for a hockey game. <laughs> Right, Brother John? Amen. You'd go with me if I canceled church, wouldn't you? Yeah. You wouldn't say, oh, no, preacher, we got to go to church. Brother John would be like, I'm driving, preach. Let's go, man. What, what time? Yeah, let's go early. Let's not have morning church either. Glory to God, man. <laughs> we'll tailgate. <laughs> he's lying back there. I know that's what he's thinking. It's a, it's a love of pleasure. We find time to do that. That brings us pleasure. But we don't think that that has anything to do with God, and he's the only one that really blinks, brings real pleasure. Amen. Because it's not temporal. Because them dudes will lose that game, and you'll go home crying. Or they'll win the game and lose the one next week and get knocked out of the Big Ten or whatever they're in. I don't have any idea how any of that junk works, but they're lovers of pleasure. <laughs> I mean, lovers of pleasure. The word rather there. Uh, in John 3, verse number 19, the writer put it this way by definition. Uh, one, I'm sorry, one man put it this way by definition, that word rather. It's, just, it's used in John 3, verse number 19. This statement definitely does not mean that they also love God to some extent. It means that they do not love God, get ready, at all. I agree with that writer. Well, I love God some. No, ma'am. No, sir. The more I'm around it, the more I, I, I believe that to not be true. You don't love God at all. You have found something to replace your love of God. A job. Money. Grandkids. How do you know that, preacher? You put it on the internet. Dummy. Did I say that out loud? Maybe we ought not be recording it because they're liable to watch it. It's already out. I've said it 300 other times. You have showed me on the internet all the things that you love. And yet, when it comes to God, I could send out a search party and we couldn't find you. I mean, we could hire the FBI to track you down. We couldn't find you on a Sunday. But I know where you were on Thursday. I know where you were on Saturday morning. You put it on the internet. <laughs> there's something wrong with us. Brother Ray, there's something wrong with us, man. <laughs> something wrong with your wife. Yeah, I'd agree with that one. <laughs> I mean, there's, we are messed up. Well, no, I, I mean, you, you don't understand. I, 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 I mean, it, it's my grandkids. I gotta go to their football game. You do? 
Where's that in the Bible? Amen. Oh, I know I'm getting personal and you're getting quiet. You don't have grandkids playing football. I got grandkid. Is he ain't playing football on Sunday. And if he is, I'll knock his stinking lights out. It don't make any difference. That's my boy. I can do that. He knows better. No, I, I mean, do you, do you get what I'm saying? We have found something to replace God, and we call it pleasure. And we, that outlet for pleasure is in a lot of things. And we've got to get back to the place where we're lovers of God because we do not love God and love. We love this and we do not love God. Because when I loved pleasure, I can just tell you, Brother Hawk, I didn't have a real affinity for God. I loved pleasure. I liked my boat. And I liked to go out on it on Sunday. Now, when I was out on the boat, I, Brother Mark, I wasn't driving around going, boy, God's creation is so beautiful. Mm, honey, I mean, isn't this grand out here, how we're out here on this lake, and we're meeting with God out here. Isn't it wonderful? And I was like, woo, open her up, let's go, come on, I dive, I dive. I'm thinking about God, I was thinking about myself and how much pleasure I was going to have. Man, and then I'd go home, woo, that was an awesome day. And get up the next morning, I wish I didn't have to go to work, going to work. What'd you do? Oh, man, took the boat out, oh, man, we had us a time yesterday. I wasn't thinking about God. But I was sure happy in the pleasure that I was living in. Do you see why I said that a lot of that list goes right into Christendom also? Because we have replaced so many things in our life. And God gets left out. There's one thing I wouldn't want to be, Brother Hawk. He doesn't want to be a pastor. He told me that three times before the service. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to be God. Because I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time being left out of some things. I mean, I, I can carry my feelings right here, and when somebody hurts them, I can feel like, man, they didn't even invite me. I didn't even cross their mind. They didn't think about me. Imagine that times a million, times five million, because I want to tell you that's exactly how God feels right now. We sit here tonight, and that's how he feels, Brother Caston. He goes, man, Calvary Baptist Church is having church. And those people aren't even thinking about me. They're thinking about themselves. Wow. Wow. <laughs> How in the world does he not blow this thing apart now? Just for the sake of Christians, forget the lost people. Forget them. I'm talking about us. You say, preacher, we're here tonight, man. You're preaching to the choir. I understand that. So why would you be telling us that, preacher? Because that just tells me we got to be more fervent. Maybe, maybe if we enjoyed God a little bit more, somebody that's struggling might look at you and go, you know, I, I think I've been missing out because, boy, they really seem to be enjoying God a little bit. But maybe the reason that it's so easy for us to love other, th other things other than God is because nobody sees us enjoy God. And so when it comes right down to it, they look at them and go, well, they go all the time and they don't enjoy God. So I can not go and not enjoy God and I can be in the same shape and I don't have to sit there and listen to that handsome preacher. Good luck <laughs> I forgot to throw that in this morning, by the way. I just, I want to plug that while I got a 30-second chance that I said this morning that all, you know, I was talking about qualifications for a preacher, and the one that I forgot was the most important was that, that he had to be handsome, and I was going to say, thank the Lord you got that one covered. We don't have to go there. We don't have to listen to that. We don't have to do any of that. We can enjoy ourselves, and guess what? We're the same. They just go to church, and we don't. Right? We don't enjoy God. We can be in church with Jeff and not love God. <laughs> because when I was backslidden every Mother's Day, I went to church. Do you know why I went to church? I bet you can figure it out. I'll give you two guesses. Why do you think I went to church? Do you, uh, do you think I went to church because I loved God? Or do you think I went to church because I loved my mother? 
You just won $500, sir. See me after the service. <laughs> now the rest of you wish you'd answer, don't you? No, I went to church. Right. I went to church because I love my mother, not because I love God. Oh, I got to be in church today. It's Mother's Day. I, I really love God. No, I'd go because I'd be like, oh, I, I do love my mother, and I suppose she's going to be in church today. So I, I guess I, I better go to church so I can at least see her there, and it'll make her happy for me. I mean, that was the only driving thought that I had. I go to church, and this one, this was the kind of the afterthought, and I'd never say it to her. But man, if I go, it'll shut her up, Miss Stacy. She'll stop bothering me. Calling me, you coming to church, coming to church. Yeah, I'm gonna come to church. I'm gonna come to church, all right. Come to church and run you over, mother. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So, in closing, we have this whole entire list. And in verse number five, I read that verse for a reason. Having and we, got, we didn't get messed up because the Lord knows what he's doing. This morning we would have covered a lot of this. Having a form of godliness. There's a deception. Form means a semblance or an outward form. Religion as a window dressing. That's what form is. It's religion as a window dressing. I walk by. Boy, is that pretty. There's a dummy underneath it. You ever think about that? Man, that is a sharp looking pair of blue jeans. It's a window dressing because there's a dummy wearing the pair of blue jeans. There's nothing in there. Right? There's not a real person in there. It's a form of a person. And this type of religion that is talking about here, a form of godliness, it is a deception. You might as well have an automobile without a motor, Fred Flintstone. That's what it is, right? I mean, it's a boat without an oar. Professing Christians who are bound by evil and sinful habits that they should have conquered years ago if their faith was real. How many times have we discussed this exact same thing and we don't conquer them? Why? Why? You ever ask yourself that question? People struggle, say, struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling. And 20 years later, they're still struggling. And am I the only person that looks at them and goes, Really? You couldn't somewhere along 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, you couldn't somewhere find the, the, the God that can break those chains that seem to be binding you. I know we're sinful creatures. I'm talking about these sinful habits. Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset you so that you may run the race. The Apostle Paul said, we've got to take some things aside. Why is that? What is wrong? They have a form of godliness, but they are definitely denying the power thereof. What is wrong with that? Something bad wrong with that. External has nothing to do with internal. What happened to the days, Christian, when the revival meetings used to close the bar? Billy Sunday closed every bar in every town he ever preached in. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Brother Dan, does Billy Sunday preach the same God that we preach. So he serves the same God that I serve. And that God back then had enough power, and that man of God got up and thundered about booze and alcohol and all of its evils, and the bars in town would close, not because they were afraid of Billy Sunday, because they didn't have any more patrons. It's dead. You know what? Here's, what? here's what a revival meeting is nowadays. I'm sorry to say this. I'm involved in a lot of them. They're preaching contests held by professional pulpiteers. You know how many meetings I've been in like that? I don't have enough time to share them with you. But every single one of us, if we've been saved any amount of time, have been in that meeting. I wonder if so-and-so is going to out-preach so-and-so. I wonder what so-and-so is going to say tonight that's going to be more shocking than what brother so-and-so said last night. I don't know. Is he going to say something from the... B-I-B-L-E. 
Because that's really what I'm hoping for. Good, old-fashioned Bible preaching. You can preach about sin and against it. Just preach it from the Bible. Please. Travel the country. Spend all kinds of churches' money and get big love offerings and fly in planes and do all these fancy things so that you can try to out-preach or get your name here or do this or do that. Who are you helping? How many great things have happened in all the places that you've been? You call yourself a great revivalist. Show me all the great revivals that have followed you. Oh, that's right. There aren't any. The same group of people come to your meeting every year, go to the altar, confess the same sin every year. Brother Mark, I've been in a meeting where I saw that happen four times in a row. Four years in a row, the same group went forward, God, oh God, I'm giving up rock music! And I said, my wife said, why are you bothering me during the invitation? I said, didn't he give up rock music last year? <laughs> it's not far, I'm not joking. And her and all her spiritualness said, and the year before. I kid you not, I can see the kid's face to this day. I can, dude, give it up and give it up. I mean, give it up and pick it up and then just get it right at the next meeting and give it up. What's up with that? Form of godliness. Because it's this. God bless you. It's an awesome decision, dude. See you next year. We need the power of God. And just say, I'm going to give it up. And the devil's going to try to get me to get back at it again. And I'm going to kick that dude right in the teeth. And he might grab me again with it, but I'll just kick him again. That's all right. And I'll give it up. Hey, I'm not against that. What I'm saying is, something, man, we've turned this thing into like a show. Forget all that junk. And have God's power. Who cares about what somebody else thinks about you, how long your dress is, how nice your suit is. Who cares how short your hair is? Who cares? Who stinking cares? And I'm a standards guy. Spend five, I mean, I'm for standards, high standards. I'm for all kinds of standards. Some I wouldn't even, I mean, I'm for, I'm for having all the standards. But I'm saying, who stinking cares when you're as wicked as hell on the inside? Amen. I've reached it right there with it. I just want some real Christians. You may not look like me. You may not dress like me. But bless God, you got a hold of the throne of God this morning. Amen. And God's doing something in your heart, and five years from now, you probably will. Well, you'll never look like me. <laughs> you, you can dream about that, and you can wish for that, but it ain't ever going to happen, all right? So stop trying. But you know what I'm saying? Five years from now or two years or one year from now when I come back and I see you and I have seen the power of God do that several times in recent days in people's lives. And I go back and I look at them and I say, wow. Man, when I first met you, you and now look at you, you're preaching. They're not denying the power. It's real. Father, Lord, help us. Lord, help us to be real on the inside. I'm not worried about realism on the outside, and even though I'm, I'm, I'm for looking right, Lord, I'm for it. We've got to get back to the place where we look right and act right, dress right, smell right. Look like a Christian. I preach about it. Lord, you know that. But, Father, I'm looking for some real Christians. I think there's some represented in this room. They don't have it all figured out, but by the grace of God, they are striving to figure it out one day at a time. And I think that's all that you want from us. And they're not looking at a preacher tonight that has it all figured out, how I wish. But I don't want to be a window dressing for Christianity. Because Lord, no matter if I'm in a pair of blue jeans and a baseball cap, I want people to know that there is a godliness about me that is internal. So, Lord, you help us. Maybe we fell into this list somewhere. Help us to get that right. Whatever is needed tonight, God, you have to do the work. Let's stand. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Take